You are now listening to the Griot's Black Podcast Network, Black Culture Amplified. Hi, and welcome to The Blackest Questions. I'm your host, Dr. Christina Greer, politics editor for The Grio and associate professor of political science at Fordham University. In this podcast, we ask our guests five of The Blackest Questions so we can learn a little bit more about them and have some fun while we're doing it. We're also going to learn a lot about black history, past and present. So here's the way this works. We have five rounds of questions about us, black history, the whole diaspora, current events, everything. With each round, the questions will get a little bit tougher, and the guest has 15 seconds to get it right. If they answer the question correctly, they will receive one symbolic black fist and hear this. If they get it wrong, they'll hear this. But we'll still love them anyway. And after the five questions, there'll be a black bonus round at the end just for fun. I like to call that black lightning. Our guest for this episode today is Brooklyn restaurateur by the way of the beautiful island of Haiti, Chef Nadege Florimond. She's an award-winning speaker, author, and chef. Her catering company, Florimond Catering, has catered for companies and institutions such as Anheuser-Busch, Columbia University, BET News, and The Colbert Report, as well as notable, notable individuals such as Vivica A. Fox and Dr. Mehmet Oz's organization, Health Corps. Nadege has also catered at the White House. She recently opened a new eatery in Flatbush, Brooklyn, called Bunun, where you can find her signature plantain sandwiches and nachos. Nadege, thank you so much for joining us at The Blackest Questions today. Thank you so much, Dr. Greer. What an amazing introduction. I was like, is that me? That's you, because you're kind of an amazing person, so I just got to let everybody know. One, we got to hang out at Bunun in Flatbush. So when you're in Brooklyn, people, come and support and eat these plantains and support Nadege, who's an amazing chef and author. And so, Nadege, tell us quickly, how did you get into cooking and catering and being an entrepreneur and overall just like, you know, woman of the 21st century? <laughs> Completely accidental. Uh, it all started my junior year at Columbia University. I was studying political science. I thought I was going to follow your path and actually go into politics, become a lawyer. Uh, grew up with a single dad in Brooklyn who happens to be a phenomenal, phenomenal cook. So he taught mm. me pretty early on how to cook. So since I was eight, I've been throwing down. But you know, being from an immigrant household, no way was that supposed to be a career path. But when I got mm -hmm. to school, I was very nostalgic. First time away from home. Even though I was only across the bridge in Manhattan, Brooklyn felt like miles away. So food was really high connected. I started cooking for my friends as a form of comfort for me, but also as a way of introducing them to Haiti. Because I was just so used to the conversation about Haiti being around the politics, the turmoil. And mm -hmm. I realized when I introduced food, we talked about other things, the culture, the people, the similarities with other groups. So I was like, yeah. I like this part way better. So I really just started cooking as fun. Then it became my side hustle. Because, you know, when you're in college, you got to pay those bills. <laughs> yes. And we can't go and not work, right? We don't have, like, you know, mm -hmm. daddy and mommy. At least I did it, right? So I had to do some working and then catering on the side, going on Craigslist. And I was like, wait, people are w willing to pay me to cook? So it kind of, like, became the high side hustle. Moved back to Brooklyn in 2003 when I graduated. Worked for an elected official because law was supposed to be the path. So I worked for Congresswoman Yvette Clark, who was in the council at the time. But I just kept more meeting people that still wanted me to cater. So we kind of like mm -hmm. grew my clientele on the catering side. And then a year later, in 2004, I was like, you know what? It's time we take this full, 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 full throttle. Wow. Well, I'm so glad I didn't know you in college because I would have eaten you out of house and home. <laughs> Everyone who knows me knows that I'm a rice connoisseur. I love rice and peas. I love rice and beans. And I think Haitian rice and beans is my favorite. So one, I can't wait to go to Bunnan. Two, I might show up at your doorstep after this <laughs> taping and just like a little mouse with a bowl. Just like feed me, Nadej. Now, you know what's interesting though? You talk about your father being an amazing cook. And I think for a lot of folks, when we think about um, cooking and passing down these recipes and so much a part of our culture and heritage, we sort of think of it as a matrilineal line and not necessarily a patrilineal line. Is that something that's kind of unique to your family? Or do you think that it, there's a much larger narrative about food and fathers that we don't really talk about as much when we talk about sort of black people in the kitchen? No, I definitely think there is more beyond me, but I do think it's not the norm, right? I mean, again, mm -hmm. 
coming here at a young age. My mom stayed in Haiti for her, you know, her personal reasons at the time. My dad was like, okay, I want my daughter. So I came here. So I actually had a fellowship once where I wrote, it was for this, um, fellowship called Feed Into Worlds. And I was exploring how immigration has basically changed how Haitian men view cooking. Because traditionally, same way, it is very much uh, the women cook, men stay out of the kitchen, men are spoiled. Mm -hmm. But coming here, right, some of them come with their wives having to stay behind. Or they come here at a young age and they no longer, you know, they don't have their parents with them. So cooking now became a thing that, like a survival, as opposed to something that was just like automatically a woman's work. The idea of seeing chefs in America kind of like changed the narrative, I think, for a lot of yeah. Haitian men that actually perhaps it liked it on a personal level, but felt that, okay, society wise it wasn't accepted for them to be in the kitchen so now they're here i used to do these cooking classes all over brooklyn and men would come they're like oh my god i can't wait to make my mother a meal because she's been cooking for me my whole life mm -hmm. so i think it's just like just general like the mentality around cooking and men in the kitchen has shifted for a lot of immigrant men and haitian men but definitely mm -hmm. i'm not the norm most people you will see it's my mom my aunt my grandmother Right. But I think you make such an interesting point because with a lot of these cooking shows, you've got these male chefs and then we don't normally think about men in the kitchen. It's sort of men chefs that have these shows and these fancy restaurants, but that is part of a, a male line of cooking as well. And black men too. Oh, uh, okay. So this is a different podcast <laughs> episode where we bring your dad on and we have a whole conversation. Oh, wow. and that's... <laughs> he's a, he's a We're character. not ready. I don't know if you're ready. He's... <laughs> We're not ready. <laughs> Well, so Nadej, are you ready to play the blackest question? Oh, I don't know if I'm ready. I was like, I haven't been in school in 20 years, but let's hope I, I remember something or know something. Right. And just as a reminder, this is a time for us to have fun, to educate our audience, to educate ourselves. And just remember that black people have been, you know, doing so much uh, around the diaspora for, you know, as long as we've been on this planet. So I'm ready. I hope we learned something. And you ready for question number one? I'm ready, I'm ready, I'm ready. Scared, but ready. <laughs> okay, first question. Brazil has a population of over 55 million Afro-Brazilians. Which country has the next highest number of Blacks outside of Africa with a population of 46 million? You always hear about Brazil being the second largest. You don't talk about next. I'll guess the United States. You're correct, the United States. And although the transatlantic slave trade brought the majority of African Americans to the United States, many Africans migrated to the U.S. voluntarily, as you know. And your homeland of Haiti comes in at just over 10 million of descendants from West and Central Africa, mainly from Ghana, Cameroon, Angola, Sierra Leone, Benin, and among other countries. Now, when you were in Colombia and in some of your travels, you know, how do you make that connection with cooking and food and our shared histories and our collective histories coming from the continent to countries in Central America, to countries in the Caribbean and also the United States? No, being in Cartagena, like Cartagena was the main city I visited and we took a bus tour to Palenque. But just doing that tour and seeing some of the foods that they cook, like they make these like uh, fudge bars, they make all these co out of coconut, like they grate coconut. I was like, wait, we do this in Haiti too. So, and then it's very special to them. Like even in Cartagena, if you go to the supermarket, all of those sweets and, and, and cookies and different things that these particular group of um, descendants of the original uh, Africans that were left, uh, that, that flee to that city, all of it in the general city, they all buy from this one town. They still maintain their own language. So I really felt like, oh my God, it's like I'm in Haiti, how we develop the Creole language there. So the fact that they still maintain their own language. So for me, travel has always been about that. Like I do culinary tours. I have one coming up in Haiti soon in January and I have one coming up in uh, Colombia again because I just feel like there's more connection and there's differences. I always tell people, it's just different boat stops that our people were dropped in but whatever traditions we could carry with us whenever i step on 
a new soil. I'm always like looking like, okay, this seems very familiar. This reminds me of home. And food has been one of those ways that we maintain the history and those traditions. And uh, oftentimes, like, you know, you'll see that through the food. And that's what I know. Uh, I really picked up when I visited Cartagena. Well, clearly the political scientist in you has, has merged with the chef in you. I mean, because essentially you're talking about my book, Black Ethnics. You know, I mean, I'm talking about diaspora. I'm talking about our shared connections. What is one dish that besides say like the coconut, what's a, a particular dish where you, in your travels, you just keep seeing over and over again, just in different iterations in the diaspora? Cornmeal. Cornmeal is one of those things that I feel like almost we all have a form a version of it in Haiti, we call it my mule in the south, in the U.S., we call it grits. In other parts of the Caribbean, they call it cuckoo. I find like we've always found ways to kind of like make it our own and also show that connection. Another dish is fufu, uh, which is another like, again, we make it out of different root vegetables. Uh, in Puerto Rico, mofongo is a form of fufu when you really think about it, because that is mm -hmm. a pounded uh, plantain. Plantain. <laughs> but most of the That's other... Right. Uh, countries you'll see like yam you'll see breadfruit like in haiti we use breadfruit in the north of haiti they use yam which i didn't even know because my family's from the south so there's a lot of things that's happening that we're more connected than we really think we are mm, i love it are you ready for question number two? Oh yes i love these shared connections nadege and i just love what you're doing inside and outside the kitchen to remind us of our connectivity, especially in this moment where so many people are feeling unmoored, you know, uh, not just because of COVID, but just feeling isolated emotionally. Uh, the way you think about food and the kitchen and diaspora and black people is just, you know, it sticks to your bones, <laughs> as old folks would say. Thank you. Okay, question number two, because this is your favorite plant, I know it. The plantain plant <laughs> is said to have originated where? Ooh. I like to think Haiti, but I know it's not from there. So, <laughs> Asia? So the answer is Southeast Asia. So a major group of banana varieties are either boiled or fried in savory dishes, and the ripe fruits are mildly sweet and are often cooked with coconut juice or sugar for flavoring. The plantain plant is a gigantic herb that springs from an underground stem. And so there are two groups of plantains that grow in tropical America, Indian, India, Egypt and Africa. And so the horn plantain and the French plantain are the two types of plantain. And I know that the plantain is one of your favorite, favorite, favorite <laughs> items to cook. Um, it's my love you know, language. When I, that is your love language. Um, and your t-shirt, what does your t-shirt say again? Plantain is my love language. <laughs> plantain is my lovely. And you can, do you sell those at the store? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. At your, at Bun <laughs> Bunnan? Bunnan, yes, we do sell in Flatbush, Brooklyn. We do so, sell the okay, I need to swing by and obviously get myself a plantain t-shirt. So when I studied abroad in London, I had a, a, a flatmate from Italy and I would make plantains. Um, one, it's an inexpensive way to have a snack, a treat, uh, and I, you know, fry them up in there and I put, I put a little cinnamon on mine. And she, you know, she came in one day and she's like, what, what is this? And I said, it's a plantain. And she, you know, she'd never seen one. She'd never smelled one. So I gave her a little taste and she tasted it and she's like, it's, a banana. And I was like, well, no, not really. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's in the family, I guess. You know, but she was looking at it and it looked like a banana to her. It sort of tasted like a banana. So whenever I made my plantain, she would always come in and say, like, oh, you're making banana cousin. <laughs> or cousin like banana. That. that is banana's cousin. I like it. Yes. Yeah, so, so every time I make plantains, I always chuckle to myself thinking of this flatmate uh, and I'm and I just say to myself, well, you know, it's time to make some banana cousin. So as you make your plantain, which is your signature dish, what other dishes do you think go really well with plantains? And what brought you to use the plantain as your signature dish? I mean, again, uh, we're located. Banan is located at the Flatbush K K Market, which is now called Flatbush Central. I just remember growing up in Brooklyn. Flatbush K and Market, which is right on the corner of Flatbush and K and Avenue in Brooklyn, for the, the viewers that know Brooklyn very well, that is Little Caribbean. It is Caribbeanville. It's Jamaica, Guyana, Trinidad, Haiti, all rolled into one smaller island. Hey, don't forget the Bahamas. The Bahamas, of course. Those my Bahamas. people. <laughs> so, yeah, so 
I just remember going there. And that's where my dad would take me on, on Saturdays where we would shop for very traditional products. Like you can find those things that you can only get back home. But these vendors, these older women would sell these traditional things that they either carried in their suitcases when they traveled back and forth or whatever it was. So they kind of shut down for a few years, redevelopment, of course. Uh, and they were building the building and then they created a food court on the bottom. And to me, I was like, everyone was like, now that you should open up something. And I had no idea what I wanted to open up because I never wanted a restaurant. I've been catering so long. I love the freedom that it allowed me. So I was like a brick and mortar. Mm, mm. That sounds like stress. <laughs> But I was just so connected to the story of the Flatbush Cake Market because, again, the fact that it came back, it's been an institution that's been in the community for 30 years. I was like, I mean, I like restaurants, but I do like the idea of maintaining our cultural heritage as much as possible. And to the extent that I can contribute to that, I wanted to be part of it. It's such a cute building. The vendors are great. And I was like, you know what? I'll get one of the food halls. And I was like, what can I sell? Rice and plantains. They are really my two love languages. Mm -hmm. so I was like, I could do different rices from around the world, like Joe Love, Joan Joe. Somebody can steal that idea because I just can't run any more businesses. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I just wanted a place that had that. And then I was like, plantain. When I think about the plantain, I think of so many people. Like, I just came back from Colombia. They have it for breakfast, lunch, dinner, mm -hmm. every meal. I think of Jamaica. I think of Haiti. I think of all these different places. And I was like, oh, my God, I would love how this one fruit really does connect the whole black diaspora. And how can I make it cool? Because I know West Indians, we like to eat it with salt fish and herring yeah. and liver in the mornings. Like, it's a breakfast food where I'm from. Like, plants, and we yeah. eat it mainly, like, boiled for breakfast. Or if we're eating it for dinner, we flying it up like tostones. The green ones, we fry them, flatten them up, and fry them again and have them as a side dish. But I was like, I love planting so much. I want it to be the star. I want it to be the main course. How can I create a place around that? And just really thinking and thinking, and eventually the idea came to me. I wanted planting everything. I had seen planting sandwiches before, and I was like, mm, they are right. And I was like, how can I make it my signature while also adding other planting things, which is planted fries, which I don't usually have anywhere else I've gone. The planting chip nachos, you know, I didn't know any other restaurants. And like I tell people, I teach entrepreneurship to middle schoolers and high school students. And I was like, that's really what entrepreneurship is about, right? It's problem solving. Mm. Seeing a need, even if it's a personal need, you, you, you may find out other people have the need. And I think people were really tired of having planted as a side dish because they've been flocking to Banan just so they can have their plantain filled. And it's just been a great experience. And I think that it's such an element of creativity as well. You know, not just filling a need, but also filling someone's need to feel something different, something uh, new and exciting from, from a, a plant or herb that, you know, we think we know. And this is a whole new way of looking at it. You've just kind of shifted the lens for us for this this item that we've had on our plates for, for decades. Yeah, and also to another component that really intrigued me was street food. Like when I think of Haiti, mm -hmm. like I wrote a book called Haiti Uncovered, a regional adventure into the art of Haitian cuisine. And for me, that book was about traveling to Haiti and exploring the food in its traditional form. People are like, well, if you want to write a book on Haitian food, why don't you just ask all the Haitian people in New York? And I was like, that's cool, but we know Haitian food through the eyes of an immigrant, right? Uh, people who traveled abroad. I wanted to explore the food and bring it back to people like myself that grew up here, but really from the hands. And I also wanted the stories connected to it because yes, I'm a great cook, but there are way better cooks than me. I think what has always set me apart is the fact like I really care about the stories that are connected yeah. to food. And for me, traveling Haiti over the course of a year and talking to different people, seeing the role food plays in their homes, different class structures was just amazing to me. But another thing that captivated me was street food. And street food in Haiti is known as fritai, which is fried everything. And the pattern <laughs> is like the thing, like when you're walking the street, it's late night, you're rushing somewhere, you grab you some fried plantains with some fried pork, which is known as grill, and that's what you're having. And that's what you have. So in creating 
the space i wanted to present kind of like that idea of fritai which is street food but like you said in a creative different way where you could sit and have it in a way that you probably didn't imagine but when you really break it into its parts you're like oh my god this is free time I'm blown. <laughs> <laughs> okay well listen i can't keep you all day even though i want to <laughs> i gotta we're gonna move on to question number three you ready three 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 i'm ready i'm ready okay this renowned military commander led the haitian independence movement during the french revolution 1787 to 1799 who is he to say l'ouverture. You are correct. <laughs> and his original name was Francois Dominique Toussaint, born in 1743 in Saint-Domingue, and he died in France in 1803. He emancipated the enslaved people and negotiated for the French colony of Hispaniola, uh, Saint-Domingue, to be governed by former enslaved people as uh, a French protectorate. And in 1801, Toussaint returned to Spanish Santo Domingo freed the enslaved people, which gave him command of the entire island of Hispaniola, which is now known as Haiti and the Dominican Republic. And so being from Haiti, did you and your father sort of growing up talk about Toussaint L'Ouverture or do you remember reading books about him uh, either in school or when you got to Columbia? Funny enough, I always tell people I became Haitian when I went to college. Mm, Even though I was- So many people, I talk about this with black ethics. So many people uh, <laughs> feel that way. Because I was born in Haiti, but I came at seven. My dad was that group of, you know, people that came when they really wanted to disconnect from Haiti, right? Whether it was for political turmoil, whatever it was that was happening. So growing up, my dad was not a proud Haitian, even though he just moved back to Haiti like a few months ago. But at the time, he was always like, no, it's not a place he wanted to talk about. So it wasn't until I got to Columbia's campus, I became really like interested in Haitian culture, because like I said, I was tired of those news sound bites in the news all the time. That was always the same narrative. I was like, is this really what we are all about? So on my own, I started exploring and wanted to learn more about Haiti because I was like, I've heard about the Haitian independence, but I didn't really fully understand what it is. So I remember the first book I picked up, which I probably still have on my shelf, was CLR James' book, The Black Jacobins. And I was like, oh, we did that. We did that. We did that, you know? So really reading those books and really self-educating myself. Like, I didn't even take classes, really, that explored it. I was very much into black lit classes, bell hooks, and all of that, learning about African-American history and culture. But the Haiti work, I really did on my own, and I was like, oh, I want to learn more. So when you mentioned Toussaint, I was like, I feel like Toussaint is so underrated, you know? Because oh, yeah. when you talk to Haitians... Because my other love is history, especially, uh, like I said, Haitian history and black history. Uh, when you talk to Haitians, they really are pro-Dessaline, who basically became the first once the slaves were free because Toussaint was tricked and killed uh, back in France. So Dessaline, they love him because he was like, no holes barred person, cut their heads kill them, let's get this, you know, independence type of person. We, so, we call him bout it, bout it. <laughs> he was, right? And we love that. But I think Toussaint was really a strategist. Like, he understood. He understood the, the space that Haiti would hold being the only black republic in the world at the time with what was going on with slavery and colonization that we had to be a little bit more diplomatic. And some people may see that as weak, but I think it's just he understood that we had to go about things in a more strategic way. Well, let's keep with the politics discussion and head on over to question number four. I hate politics. You do it so well. I love I it. Politics. <laughs> okay. Of course. I mean, listen, you've got politics, you've got history, you've got food, you've got culture, you've got creativity <laughs> and entrepreneurship. I mean, like literally you do it all. <laughs> So I'm just I'm just honored that you're spending some time with us. And real talk, we are getting your dad on this podcast because I cannot wait for the shenanigans to ensue and to hear his stories about growing up with little Nadege and taking her to the market in Flatbush. Okay, question number four. This American politician and military officer was the former Secretary of State from 2001 to 2005. Who is he? Colin Powell. That is correct. Born Colin Luther Powell on April 5th, 1937 in Harlem, New York. So Powell was the son of Jamaican immigrants, Luther and Maude Powell. He was raised in the South South Bronx and educated in New York City public schools. 
He graduated from Morris High School in 1954 without any definite plans for what he wanted to do in life. And so it was at City College in New York where he studied geology. And he was the first black U.S. Secretary of State and chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. And he died October 18th in 2021 at the age of 84. And so did you know about Colin Powell growing up? Do you know about his Jamaican heritage? No, no, I definitely knew about him. I knew about the Jamaican heritage because again, like, the one thing about being in Brooklyn, at least by the mm-hmm. time I was here, Caribbeans were like cousins. Like everybody yeah. was like, you know what's happening with other Caribbean people. And whenever something great happened, we all celebrated. So I definitely knew that. My dad loved him because I think it's just the fact like he was like black, military, like he, he felt like he, he had honor, he had strength and he's someone we spoke about in my household. My dad was big into politics, but in a weird way. Let me tell you a funny story real quick. I remember volunteering. There was a time Ruth Messenger ran for mm-hmm. office against, um, I think it was Manhattan Borough President. It was Al Sharpton and Ruth Messenger running. And I remember telling my dad, I'm in high school. I was like, I'm volunteering for this campaign. He was like, who are you volunteering for? I was like, Ruth Messenger. He goes, really? So he let me volunteer a whole week. And then he came, I came home. He was like, aren't you ashamed of yourself? I was like, why should I be ashamed? You don't like Al Sharpton. You always say, you know, he's crazy. He always is screaming on television. All kind of like funny little things. And then he's like, yeah, but he stands for you. If something happens to you right now, who do you think would fight for you? It would be Al Sharpton. I can't believe you are violent. I was like, oh my God. So just these little things. That was what growing up with my dad was like these lessons that would come in yeah. these weird forms. But I just really like, that's how politics was talked about in my household. Like really within the context of you as a person who is really fighting for you, who stands for you and just like loyalty in general. Yeah. And the shared black identity that you clearly have carried over into your food and how you think about food and, and bring in different cultures into your food. Yes. Yes. Listen, I love you Nadesh, but we have to get your dad. <laughs> Not you too, not you too. The whole, all my we should have my dad house. and your dad in conversation. Now that would be a podcast that I'm not ready for. <laughs> okay, question number five. You're doing so well. This menswear designer became the artistic director for Louis Vuitton and was the founder of Off-White. Who is he? Oof. See, I don't know fashion. Because <laughs> I just wear my t-shirts. Mm. Menswear designer. The gentleman he recently died? Yes. I so, the answer is Virgil Abloh. Virgil. <laughs> so, the late Virgil Abloh. He and his sister were raised in Rockford, Illinois by Ghanaian immigrant parents. And in 2009, Abloh interned with uh, Kanye West at Fendi in Rome. And so, they photogra- They were photographed by Tommy Tun for Style.com outside uh, in Paris uh, in what became a widely circulated picture. And so then fast forward to 2011, he became the creative director of Givenchy and moved on to create his own acclaimed off-white brand in 2013. And then in 2019, Abloh's artwork was the subject of an exhibition in the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. And so sadly, Abloh succumbed to cancer in 2021 at the young age of 41. And so... Um, you released, I heard you released a Haitian-inspired denim apron line. Yeah. And so I wanted you to talk to us a little bit more about your merging of art and fashion and design in some of your work. Because you've already said you made you, you wrote a book. <laughs> You're an entrepreneur. You've started a business. You have a catering business. <laughs> you, like, you are doing it all. And so talk to us a little bit more about this art and fashion piece that goes seamlessly with all the other things that you're building. No, uh, for me, the apron made sense. Again, like I said, for me, food is beyond just nourishment, right? It's it's the real soundtrack to our lives. It's the real soundtrack to everything we do. Food is present. Food is at our communions. It's at our weddings. It's at our uh, funerals. funerals. It's everywhere, right? So when I was traveling for the book, like I said, I really started exploring food like Okay, through the food, you can understand the politics. You can, because people ask Haitians, why do you wash your meat so much? Like, why do you clean everything extra? And then I was like, I don't know, it's just cultural. But when you really look at it, when you go on the island and, or Haiti itself, you're like, oh, refrigeration is an issue. Not everyone has food at home. So bacteria, I mean, a fridge at home. So 
bacteria builds up a little bit more quickly quicker uh, food is kept in the open markets right so there's flies there's things so it's very different because we don't have an FDA like we do here so I started realizing like food is just such an integral part of everything we do and in terms of like the clothing then we, our traditional Caribbean garb is called Cabela. It's this denim chambray fabric. And whenever people hold events and, and even like celebrations, like especially in the countryside, they have this. So dances and traditional folklore dances, they wore this dress and food was always a big part of those celebrations. And I was like, during the, uh, the initial months of the pandemic, I was sitting at home scared out of my mind because i run an events-based business i'm like what am i gonna do i was like this is the perfect time to really reconnect once again so i wrote a book taste of solitude which again was about comfort foods and connections with uh haiti and other travels that i've done but then the apron line was like oh my god it makes sense i'm at home cooking mm -hmm. i i'm being comforted by these foods i want to be able to connect and put on an apron and it just made sense for me to merge that traditional Haitian garb and Haitian art which my friend designed Gracie Xavier she designed the original art and I was like wow it's like an experience because for me it's yeah. always not just about sitting and eating a meal but it's how everything connects with right. what you do around food and where can we find said apron I have a shop that has all my crazy ideas and creations called warrior shop which is R-O-A-R-I-O-R shop.com. And you can find my t-shirts, my books, everything is on there. I just love being with a Renaissance woman. This has been the, the best part of my day. So before I let you go, we're gonna play the black bonus round and I call it black lightning, okay? Okay. So you ready? These yeah. are just fun questions. There's no right or wrong answer. Whatever comes to your mind, that's what you tell us, okay? Okay, I'm ready. Boiled plantains or fried plantains? Fried. Asian cuisine or Latin cuisine? Asian. Stewed fish or stewed chicken? Stewed fish. Porridge or grits? Ooh, that's, ooh, don't make me pick. Grits. Fried chicken or jerk chicken? Fried chicken. Okay, uh, which, within the diaspora, which city have you visited with the best food? Ooh. Scandal, scandal. Can I say, can I, can I pick? My, my country, Cap Haitian. <laughs> you absolutely can. Cap Haitian, Haiti, of course. And but a close second is Kingston, Jamaica. I, I think Jamaica makes amazing food. That's right. Jamaicans in general. Talk about some good street food, too. Yeah. Um, okay, and last but not least, what is your favorite dish to cook? Ooh, legume. Legume is this Haitian traditional dish, and it's my favorite because that's what my dad would make me after he, you know, did something wrong to me but he would never say sorry so he would make me legume legume is like stewed vegetables it's eggplants chayote carrots cabbage and then they stew they cook it and then they mash it and it's mixed with meat or seafood so whatever he wanted to be nice to me i would get mine with conk and crab and shrimp so it would be a seafood legume and to this day, it's still my favorite meal to cook because I always, I always get a chuckle because I'm like, yeah, I remember he'd make me that whenever he did something wrong, but we want to say sorry. Oh, Nadej, this has been such a treat and an honor, and I can't wait to go check out Bunun in Flatbush in Brooklyn. Uh, I want all of our New York listeners and all of our visitors to New York to go check it out so we can eat some plantains together. And I just, I wish you the best best of success with all of your various entrepreneurial pursuits and promise us you're going to come back to the blackest questions i will i will and banan is really a treat not only you get your plantains but they're stuffed or filled or topped with either grilled pork red snapper mushroom for vegetarians and we got our jerk chicken so you will get it all all those nice caribbean flavors alongside your plantain so i can't wait to have all your viewers visit us and especially you Oh, and you know I'm going to show up at your house because I still want my rice and beans. Um, so thank you so much to Nadej Florimond for joining us. I want to thank you all for listening to The Blackest Questions. This show is produced by Akila Shedrick, Cameron Blackwell, and Camille Cruz. And I want to thank our listeners for listening to The Blackest Questions. If you like what you heard, please download the Grio app and listen and watch many more great shows and share it with everyone you know. Don't forget... 
You can listen to the Griot's Writing Black podcast hosted by me, Maisha Kai. This isn't your typical writing podcast. We interview any and everybody that has anything to do with writing, from comics to poets to authors to journalists to politicians and more. Remember, that's Writing Black every Sunday right here on the Griot's Black Podcast Network. Download the Griot's app to listen to Writing Black wherever you are. <laughs>